the Africa we want, unity, consciousness, our culture, our spirituality, our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan-African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. So, Hotep, hello, 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 Karibuni, Jambo Jambo. Welcome to the Pan-African Daily TV. Uh, this uh, special edition with our brother, a mentor, activist, journalist, producer, um, educator. What else? What have we? Our brother OB is joining us live today. and We're going to have a conversation on Africa's relationships. What is it that we need to know about that? What is it that we need to learn? What are the challenges and what are the solutions and what is the way forward? So our brother is going to be educating us from his perspective and also, you know, using uh, strategically uh, case studies that he's been working on um, concerning his engagement, uh, long-term engagement as an educator for black uh, people, but also um, using the case studies of some productions that he's been doing out there, uh, focus on uh, children and history. And he has been putting out so much work, research, teachings, films, uh, educational material. So today is a pleasure to have him on the Pan-African Daily TV. So I want to thank all of you that are joining the conversation for tonight. Um, be it from the mainland or from Europe or from USA or from the Caribbean, all Africans worldwide on the continent, we are connecting and uniting ourselves to learn, to learn about ourselves, to develop ourselves. Yes, so we are so grateful to have, you know, scholars, experts, researchers, mentors, activists, big, great voices that have been on this journey for the liberation of the African people, and they've been doing amazing work out there. These are all scholars and experts that no other would talk about their work but us African people. It is a privilege for us to benefit from the enormous sacrifices and engagements that they've been putting out there, and, and now we are getting the opportunity, I can say a privilege, you know, to have them lecture us, to educate us on what is it that we should know. Be aware of the fact that the Pan-African Daily TV is focused on the Africans worldwide. And so we look for solutions or we seek sol uh, solutions to our day-to-day -day challenges affecting our communities, our people, our continent, our lives, starting from our families, our children, anything that has to do with us Africans, we are focused only on that. Our goal is to unite ourselves globally. We've been disenfranchised for so long, for decades. You know, we've had to go, on, go through crazy steps in history that no other race of people have gone through that. But today, despite all those challenges, we have had scholars and die hard, we call them the die hearts and the brave hearts of Africa that would not bother to take even a bullet in their head, to put out their work out there, put out their engagement, their time. Most of them are the expenses of their families, of their homes, of their wives, of their children uh, for the liberation of the African, of their race. They are race conscious. They are loyal to their, to their community and their people. They are faithful and they keep doing this day and night. Among such scholars that we've been having here or experts is our brother Obi Ebukna Jr. He's going to tell us about his work and we're going to get this connection for the first time here in the on the Pan-African Daily TV family. It is a warm welcome. So if you're joining in, please make sure you invite one another, you know, to join us in the conversation today. 
and like yesterday it was important i don't know if most of you followed this show with juliet rian live from the gambia where i was a guest but it was very very powerful and interesting conversation if you haven't done that we're going to do a premiere we're going to rebroadcast it live on the pan-african daily today or tomorrow yes so thank you so much for joining now back to the studio to a brother brother welcome it's so good and so nice to see you here that you look this time you create a time for us to be here spontaneously on the show i want to thank you so much for being um, here welcome thank you it's a it's an honor to be on with you beautiful so i mean out here i'm in germany sitting right here and we have about almost 32 degrees what's the weather out there where you are um about 90 degrees fahrenheit <laughs> it's oh. hot Good. So it's like we are in Africa right now. Just that it's yes, it is. like, yes, good. Mm -hmm. Fine. So today you want to um, lecture us or to, I mean, yes, of course, lecture, because that's what the Pan-African Daily TV is all about. We are not a debate platform. So we don't mm -hmm. come here and challenge one, one another. We are educating ourselves from the miseducation mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. our predecessors or our colonizers. So it is a pleasure. We want to talk about Africa's relationships, challenges and way forward. And you've been doing an incredible work out there. Just tell us a little bit about you and what is it that the audience would have to listen through this two hours conversation that we'll be having with you? Um, well, once again, um, I'm humbled and privileged to be on. We hope what we share today is um, meets your standards for the show and for the listeners out there. I wanna thank um, our sister, um, Tierney Sheree for connecting us with each other. And um, we've been waiting a while to do this. So here we go. So today we'll be talking about um, the Get Out of Cuba way campaign and movement that we're organizing at the moment. We'll be talking about our work in Zimbabwe for the last 19 years. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be talking about um, mm -hmm. our children's history and theater company and um, we'll be talking about some of the work um, we're doing we're doing in the classroom in the moment. And we'll be talking about our family history. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. OK, so we would just go back directly to you before we get this exclusive interview. Um, we, we would just like to know who you are, what is mm -hmm. it that you've been doing, where you're resident, how's the community out there and that we get into the conversation just to, right. you know, acquaintance. most of us have been cut out. So when we meet again in the family, we have to start reintroducing ourselves again. Exactly. And, stuff. and I want to start with your name because your name, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds, if I look at it, OB, Ebugna, I don't know about Ebugna, but OB is related to Nigerian in the Igbo tribe. Is this yeah. anything to do with that? Yes. Um, um, okay. My father was um, from Ozobola and okay. um, the village in, in Anambra State in um, Nigeria. Mm. Um, I lived there from three to seven years old. Um, mm. In terms of myself, um, I'm an organizer, of course, but um, skill-wise, um, I'm a journalist. I'm the U.S. correspondent in, um, to Zimbabwe's national newspaper, The Herald, uh, mm -hmm. a task and responsibility that I've had since 2008. Okay. Um, I'm the external relations officer of the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association. Um, I'm a children's playwright. I'm a co-founder of the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company and mm -hmm. the advisor to the Mass Emphasis Positive Action and Creativity Youth Brigade. Um, and I'm an African history teacher. I'm teaching um, primarily from kindergarten to um, high school. And I've been an organizer for um, 31 years now, I'm 51. Wow. I mean, brother, so, I mean, it, <laughs> it's a tradition here. We're always fishing out this kind of knowledge from us to us, like we say. Africans need to be educated now by ourselves. We're rewriting our history. And before we get into the conversation, it's just a question that we ask. Um, you, the knowledge is too much for us to be able to digest in just one session and just in two hours. So it would mm -hmm. be a pleasure if we could keep this like a continuity where you future once in a month or twice in a month, depending on how, and because your your, mm -hmm. your scope is so wide. So mm -hmm. put that at the, end of your, at, the, at the end of the conversation. So over to you. Yes, we're listening. Well, um, uh, sure. Um, 
whenever, whenever um, I'm available, I'm just humbled to know that the platform is available to me. Yes. Um, so we can begin. Um, we'll begin by talking about our campaign that we're working on. And um, once again, um, I'll begin. I'm the external relations officer of the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association. Mm -hmm. um, for people who don't know the origins of that organization, let me mention that. Um, the late Pan-African icon, um, Robert Gabriel Mugabe, um, mm -hmm. former president of Zimbabwe, he's the second African head of state to get the Jose Marti Award, which is Cuba's highest honor. The first person, and that was in 1985, the first person to get it as, that, that was a head of state was in 1984, that great son of Africa, also no longer with us, Thomas Sankara, Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. So what happened is between 1986 and 1996, 3,000 Zimbabwean teachers went to Cuba to the island of youth for training. And because mm -hmm. of that, Zimbabwe today boasts a 97% literacy rate, which is the highest on the African continent. Mm -hmm. So while we marvel at Cuba's um, military assistance in Angola for 14 years, the mm -hmm. military assistance in Guinea-Bissau, the military assistance in um, Mozambique, the um, we must look at this. We, when we focus on the 4,000 medical personnel that they have dispersed throughout the African continent today. So mm -hmm. just knowing that they made that contribution to um, Zimbabwe's educational system. So six years after their independence, they were able to come in, send those um, teachers to Cuba for training. So um, I'm the first external relations officer that organization has ever had. How I was recruited into it was 2006 when the Cuban ambassador to Zimbabwe, Cosme Torres Espinosa, who was the highest ranking Cuban diplomat to be deported from the United States. His next detail happened to be Zimbabwe. So when I got there, I paid him a surprise visit. He was shocked to see me, but happy to see me. And he told me that he wanted me to join that organization. So I've been in the organization since 2006, and I was given this responsibility um, four and a half years ago to be the external relations officer. And what that responsibility entails is building ties um, on a Pan-African scale with the work mm -hmm. we do around Cuba, both on the continent and both um, in the diaspora. Um, when the corona pandemic hit, everybody now knows by now what the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade has done, which is Cuba's international uh, medical task force that goes all over the world, throughout yeah. the Caribbean, throughout Africa, throughout Asia, throughout Europe, where they are wanted. And they have become the face of the fight against the corona pandemic. Yeah. And as the United States merged as the um, corona capital of the world, we were pushing for Cuban medical personnel to be able to come to the United States in the form of the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade. For your yeah. listeners who don't know who Henry Reeve was, he was a man of European ancestry who went to Cuba and fought on the side of the Cubans during the um, Spanish-American War. Those who know the history of Cuba know that the Spanish-American War from 1868 to 1890 was a fight between Spanish colonialism and imperialism and U.S. imperialism to see who would control Cuba's destiny. The first mm -hmm. seven presidents of the United States attempted to annex Cuba, just like they did Puerto Rico, just like they did Guam, just like they did the Virgin Islands. So um, based on the resistance of our ancestors there, we were able to fight them off. So mm -hmm. um, Understanding how the corona pandemic hit us in such an aggressive manner as U.S. born Africans, we felt it was only appropriate to fight for Cuban medical personnel to have access. So we started off with an appeal. We did not do it in a petition. We did an appeal in the tradition of David Walker's appeal. We did an appeal in the tradition of Mark, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey's appeal to white America in 1923. We did an um, appeal in the tradition of Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois' appeal to the United Nations in 1947, where mm -hmm. Eleanor Roosevelt did everything she could to try to sabotage that. We did it in the tradition of the appeal that Brother Malcolm X was working on um, in 1965. And of course, the New York Police Department, FBI, and CIA had other ideas. So we did it in that, um, in that tradition. We got organizations from all over the world, organizers from all over the world to sign on to it. And it's something that we're still pushing aggress aggressively for. Their mm -hmm. second phase of it is a camp um, to now push for um, us in the diaspora to come together to create a resource pool for the 4,000 Cuban medical personnel dispersed throughout the African continent. Mm -hmm. So um, 
technical support for them, all the stethoscopes they need, all the syringes they need, all the lab equipment they need, all the phones they need, all the computers they need to continue to build on the work that they're doing on a shoestring budget because we know how compromised they are about the blockade. Um, when I was in Cuba 21 years ago for the Caribbean and Latin American Youth Conference, Comandante Fidel Castro said that during Ilion Gonzalez's kidnapping, that the average US citizen learned more about Cuba in four months than they had in 41 years. The mm -hmm. average citizen of the world learned in the last year more about Cuba's healthcare system than they have in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the African continent, at a time where non-communicable diseases have replaced HIV, AIDS, cholera, mm -hmm. and malaria as the number one killer of the human being. And 10 years ago, they said at the United Nations, they were projecting between 2010 and 2038, 57 million deaths on this planet from strokes, diabetes, heart attacks, and what have you. And since we know that the people who have succumbed to corona are people who are compromised with respiratory diseases, this is why Cuba support the support for them is necessary. You know about their work with, during the Ebola crisis in Liberia, in Guinea, in Guinea, and Sierra Leone. We know about the thousands of young people who've had the opportunity to go to the Latin American School of Medical Sciences in Cuba and return to Burkina Faso, return to Sierra Leone, return to Guinea, return to Nigeria, and be the best doctors that they've ever had. Since 2,200 students in the United States have gone there for medical training, even though they wanted to offer 500 medical scholarships a year. So this effort is just to complement that. So we had some children in the Mass Emphasis Positive Action and Creativity Youth Brigade. They did an eight minute documentary calling for Cuban medical personnel to come. I think the documentary is eight minutes and 32 seconds, less time than it took terrorist police in Minnesota to snuff the life out of George Floyd. Mm. And then we've had two concerts, Dr. Tata, since um, in July of last year and February of this year. And when you look at the tally of artists, they've been artists representing 10 African nations, eight Caribbean nations, 17 US cities, and five European Union countries wow. who are supporting what we're doing. So um, by the end of this year, we're targeting to begin Zim the Cuban doctors in Zimbabwe, the Cuban mm -hmm. doctors in South Africa, the Cuban doctors in Guinea, the Cuban doctors in Liberia, the Cuban doctors in Nigeria, the Cuban doctors in Ghana. That's mm -hmm. where we will begin to create um, resource pools to support them. So mm -hmm. that way we give our people an alternative to the United States Agency for International Development. We give them an alternative to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Clinton Absolutely. Foundation, the Bush Actually. Foundation, mm -hmm. all of those who all of those who benefit from the rape and plunder of Africa. So mm -hmm. um, we talk about it all the time. We pontificate it all, about it all the time, but we don't offer adequate alternatives. And in a moment where it is time to stand with Cuba to show not just gratitude, to not just talk about what they've done, but to engage in organized, sustainable activity to empower them so they can maximize their potential. And mm -hmm. when we take a look at their areas, their best attributes, having the number one gerontology program in the Americas, treating the elderly for your listeners who don't know what that means, the okay. lowest HIV AIDS rate in the Americas, a program in conjunction with Venezuela to eradicate blindness in the Americas called Operation Project Miracle. Mm -hmm. um, and you think about the fact that Africa has 20 million HIV AIDS orphans, Mother Africa, mm -hmm. this is what their doctors do on the African continent. And when they're not treating the sick, they train the aspiring doctors and nurses of tomorrow who have decided to reverse the brain drain, who are not gonna bring their talents to France, not gonna bring their talents to Germany, not bring their talents to Switzerland, not bring their talents to Washington, not bring their talents to New York, but they're gonna stay put in their countries and give their people quality health care that they've never received. So that's what this project represents, the fight against the lifting the blockade on Cuba, but empowering them to continue what they've done in the field of medicine since their revolution prevailed in 1959. They have yeah. become the cornerstone of revolutionary health care on the planet. And we love the fact that they're impervious to the propaganda of our former colonizers saying that they're engaging in medical solidarity. And the reason it's important to address that is because the stereotypes and the propaganda of Africa's most hateful enemies and detractors is that when we take the path of revolution, we're bloodthirsty. 
we're willing to sacrifice our blood, but we are not bloodthirsty. We are just mm -hmm. as pe we are we are just as committed to peace as Gandhi or the Dalai Lama or any mm -hmm. or the or a Christian preacher or a Muslim mm -hmm. Imam. But it's just that we're willing to sacrifice our lives to get that peace. And through the revolutionary track, we excel in the fields of medicine, we excel in the fields of education. So we are at the forefront now of millennial development goals and sustainable development goals, basic human necessities, basic human needs. And at a time where there are 400 million Africans on the continent that live on a dollar 90 cents a day, and of the 25 countries that meet the category the United Nations called extremely poor, which means that you have, there are 784 million people that live on a dollar 90 cents a day, 400 million of them living in Africa. The timing to take on a project of this magnitude could not be better. So we're just honored to be in a strategic position to push it forward. And we're mm -hmm. calling on our sisters and brothers on the continent and different organizations. We're calling on our sisters and brothers in the diaspora and different organizations who know this is necessary to become involved in this effort. History obligates us to do this. Let's be true to history. Let's be true, good children, honorable children to our mother Africa. So that's what the Get Out of Cuba Way um, project represents. So continuing to fight for them to be in, to get inside US borders without complications mm -hmm. and to create a resource pool for their work to continue to flourish on the African continent. So they have an alternative to these imperialist NGOs and these imperialist outlets who are always scandalous in their approach to humanitarian work, because it's very hard for them to be humanitarian based on their historical track record. At the end of the day, we'll be true to our culture and true to who we really are. Mm. Ooh, um, yes. I mean, this this is uh, this is this is the point. This is the point now. Um, is studying Cuba, Zimbabwe. We know that Zimbabwe is currently uh, on the U.S. sanctions for long, just like Cuba was. And now Still is. we also they both are. Yes, and so so this kind of relationship is strategic and really on point. You said. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like this. Um, let's go back to the inauguration speech of former U.S. President Barack Obama, his first inauguration. He said, the might of our military must be matched by the strength of our diplomacy. So when we take a look at United States um, military efforts, we know that bombing nations for them, assassinating nations for them is just as common as the Ku Klux Klan burning a cross on your yard. It's their mm -hmm. preference. But what he was saying is when, they, when it's not diplomatically feasible to assassinate a leader, bomb a nation cowardly, they will starve the people to death. You must remember that the blockade on Cuba that Kennedy imposed in 1962 was only imposed after the, the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961 failed. We must understand that the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act, the sanctions imposed on Zimbabwe, were imposed because of their anger to how Zimbabwe handled themselves brilliantly during what's called Operation Sovereign Legitimacy, where Zimbabwe's military, Angola's military, and Namibia's military prevented Mobutu's network from being reestablished in the Congo, which was Susan Rice's coming out party in her pet project when she was working under the tutelage of Madeleine Albright. So mm -hmm. there, and then of course, the land reclamation program was initiated in Zimbabwe after they gave every administration since Jimmy Carter to honor the Lancaster House agreements, where they were supposed to transfer um, the money to, for uh, the Europeans who benefited from British and Rhodesian colonialism to be able to either resettle in Zimbabwe to an, a house more appropriate, an apartment more appropriate, but they procrastinated and the people took it in their own hands. And their response was imposing sanctions on the people for reclaiming their land. 350,000 families in Zimbabwe got to see their land again that had been taken from their ancestors in 1890. And keep in mind, this was at a time where the most recognized and celebrated country in the SADC region, of course, is South Africa. And today, even 83% of the people still, 83% um, of the land is still in the hands of the former colonial rulers. So as great as Madiba Nelson Mandela was, he didn't touch the land question. As great as Tabo Mbeki was, he approached it cautiously. 
Zuma approached it cautiously, but Zimbabwe approached it aggressively and they paid a price for it, but it's a price they're willing to pay because they recognize that flag independence isn't enough. And for that reason, 65% of the agricultural development in that country is being done by women. No other nation on the planet where agriculture is a staple of life, a staple of culture, is that being done. So the United oh. States and European Union's vindictive response was to impose sanctions on them. And, and the sanctions have impacted on their healthcare system because before the sanctions, they had the number one cholera tracking system in Southern Africa. They had the number one uh, malaria net rollout program in Southern Africa. They've had the most significant decline in HIV AIDS cases in Southern Africa, despite these sanctions. But the sanctions have definitely made their marks in the healthcare system, the public work system. They used to have the best roads in Africa. Now the joke is the way you can tell a driver's intoxicated is if he's not zigzagging, if he's driving in a, state, a straight line to avoid the potholes in Arare, the potholes in Bulawayo. All of this is because of sanctions. Yet the United States government and the British government try to tell us that the economy being challenged is not because of sanctions, but because of mismanagement. But that is nothing but a lie. And we have seen how diplomatic terrorism, which the sanctions represent in Zimbabwe, which the blockade represents in Cuba, which the sanctions represent in Venezuela, and what our sisters and brothers in Eritrea were subjected to for 10 years because their sanctions were just lifted two years ago. So this has become a method of the imperialists to starve everyday people and use their corporate media apparatus to make make it seem like it's negligence on the leadership of the country. And then some, and then their liberal interpretation of this is, oh, well, um, you know, uh, the sanctions do hurt everyday people. It doesn't hurt the leadership. But if the leadership of the country, we're understanding this is revolutionary leadership we're talking about, if they are one with their women, one with their men, one with their children, one mm -hmm. with their workers, one with their farmers, one with their teachers, one with their dentists, one with their heart surgeons, one with everybody that's patriotically committed to the evolution of the country's landscape, why would you say it doesn't hurt them? If I love my people, the pain of my people, the suffering of my people breaks my heart. And imperialism is using sanctions to do just that. And we we have to organize to stop them. This is great. I mean, we now we, we are having in the list of our honorary guests, uh, Brother Obi, and um, I don't know, I'm just speechless because these are all topics that we've been trying to look, I mean, but just at another point, not deeper and with facts like what you're saying it's i don't know how to even thank you or just thank the fact that you are doing this work now it, it, what is it that we need to do what is it that the african need to understand what is the right of the well, african I, now I, I think we just have to continue to use plat and we thank you because you're so courageous with this platform and it's no coincidence that you all have been subjected to the hell you've been subjected to. Every time you tell the truth, they try to interfere and sabotage this outlet. They're not going to be able to stop it. We just have to continue. We just have to continue to share. What Cuba and Zimbabwe have taught us is that information is now the first line of defense. We yes. we fought we fought you on the battlefield. Now um, at that same organization of Caribbean Latin American um, conference that I was at in Cuba 21 years ago. Comandante Fidel Castro said, the war of the the first part of the 21st century will be the war of ideas. And Zimba and the late um, former minister of information and publicity and broadcasting services in Zimbabwe, the great Tachona Jaconia, one of Africa's finest diplomats ever, he said that um, information is the first line of defense. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're in the best position to challenge their lies about our, our ancient history, and our modern history. So anytime that they talk about a country, like one of the things they'll say about Zimbabwe, for example, is, oh, the unemployment rate is so high. If I own my own farm, why would I go and look for a job? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm running my farm. I'm running my farm, and I'm employing other people on the farm. So why would I put on a, a a nice Western suit or my cleanest dashiki and dust up my resume and go and look for a job? I have a job. I have a responsibility to run a farm. And since Africa's main focus at the UN, I mean at the AU, is agriculture and food security, 
what I do on my farm in Zimbabwe offers an alternative to being a beggar as a neo-colonialist. And since mm -hmm. in Southern Africa, 67% of the workforce, their, their workers con connected to the agro-economy, since I saw the most agriculturally vibrant part of Africa, Zimbabwe mm -hmm. is setting the benchmark. Zimbabwe is setting the tone for that. So it's something that we have to, um, we cannot let these people just lie to us. When they yes. say that Zimbabwe doesn't want to take least developed country status, that would be a confession saying they can't run their own country. How are the, there are 53 countries that have LDC status, 37 of them in Africa? Tell them, let them tell us how they benefit from being LDC, having that status. They don't benefit from it at all. So their so-called donor programs, we they say on record Africa's received um, $4 trillion in aid in the last 70 years. How have we benefited from it? What the aid has done is it's used to manipulate us. It's used to intimidate us. It's used to bribe us. And the fact that we have these neo-colonialist governments at the helm, that's the only reason they can get away with it. And then they mm -hmm. want to talk about democracy. But this is the funniest thing about it. And we've been having this conversation with people lately. How many um, African women prime ministers and women presidents have we had in the last 20 years? What other continent has had more than us? So when the National Democratic Institute under Madeleine Albright's leadership come to observe our elections, or the International Republican Institute um, come to observe our elections, when the National Endowment for Democracy, which were all created in 1983 after Reagan spoke to European Union's parliament saying they needed more think tanks to ensure victory during the Cold War. How do they come to Africa and tell us that we need a more civilized brand of democracy when Joyce Banda has presided over Malawi, while Ethiopia currently has a woman president, while Ellen Johnson Salif was the president in um, Liberia for 12 years. Even South Africa had a woman president for 24 hours, right? Interim. Mm -hmm. um, Samba Panza was the interim president of the Central African Republic. So how can they come and tell us when all, all they have to show after all these years is a glorified runner up named Kamala Harris? We should be, and even though we don't agree with the majority of these um, neo-colonialist governments in Africa, it's a testament to the culture that the people have no problem with a woman being at the helm of leadership. So right. how can they come and lecture us about that? This, but it's in the same way that the missionaries came to tell us that we weren't spiritually civilized, right. even though we're responsible for the um, advancement of Christianity, the advancement of Islam, Judaism is ours. That's why we're so offended when Zionists in Israel torture and um, eliminate Palestinians in the name of a religion, that, a spiritual expression that we gave to the world. So mm -hmm. how can they come and give us any advice on spiritual direction, on political direction, on humane direction? They're not morally qualified to do it. And because of purse strings, because of bribery, because of intimidation, we can't tell them to go to hell. We can't dismiss them. The only country, they've only been a handful of countries that have done it, but we're moving forward and it is projects like the one we're working on right now that can show yes. our people that there's light at the end of the tunnel. So there's yes. no reason that we can't put all our resources together and tell those Cuban doctors that they've earned it, they deserve it, and we want them to continue their work on the African continent for our mm -hmm. benefit till we are strong enough to duplicate what they have done in Cuba. But we consider Cuba part of Africa because 35 mm -hmm. countries got their independence from settler colonialism between 1957 and 1960. And since the Cuban revolution triumphed in 59, and since 70% of their people are African, and since those are nothing but Spanish speaking Africans there who were dropped off after being kidnapped from Africa. And even though mm -hmm. their names are Rodriguez or Castro or Valdez or were Vera, we, we embrace them just as much as we embrace anyone born because as Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah taught us, we're not mm -hmm. Africans because you're, you're not an African because you're born in Africa. You're an African because Africa is born inside of you. So even okay. if you've never been to Africa like the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Africa is still born inside of you. And these amputated narratives of our experience that choose to disconnect the diaspora from the continent or encourage us to go country by country, region by region, street by street. We're not embracing any of that no more. We recognize that blood is thicker than water. So we're going to bring our history together. We're gonna to bring our organizations together. We're going to bring our agenda together. And there's no force on earth that can stop it. 
All they can yeah. do is come up with watered down alternatives to it, but our vision is clearer than it's ever been before. So take neo-colonialist governments in Africa and give them all the money you want. Have them call Africans back to the diaspora. But the moment that they come back to places and they tell the Africans born in Africa, the only conversations they're having with them is telling them to clean their toilet or to cook their food or to water their mm -hmm. plants. Those Africans on the continent are gonna set them straight and tell them that isn't what we're expecting you to come here and do. We want you to come back like France Fanon came back. We want you to come back like Kwame Ture came back. We want you to come back with the African fighting spirit driving you not to be part of this neo-colonialist paradigm that is aimed mm -hmm. at our destruction. So they can, they can pump up all these puppet governments that they want who are encouraging our people to come home and engage in mischief, come home and engage in reactionary behavior, come home and then when their sisters and brothers erupt in these different countries, they're gonna run to the US embassy faster than Usain Bolt runs on the track field and say, take mm. them back to the United States, take them back to France. We're creating an alternative to that. There's no need to mm. even spend a lot of time belaboring on it. All we have to do is come up with the projects and campaigns and initiatives that are aimed at fundamental change of the existing landscape and the tradition of the fighters that we admire the most who are no longer here with us, but through our work, we keep them alive. Ashe, Asante, Asante Sana. This is powerful, brother. I don't know, I, I, I yeah, yeah, it is, it is as it is. Um, you're a journalist, and mm -hmm. we are looking forward on the Pan-African Daily TV. Like you said, information is the biggest weapon for in I mean, information, and we know what we're talking about, information. Information from who, to who, by who. Yes. That's actually, exactly. yes. And I mean, and, and the thing about it is the tradition is so rich. Um, we're, we're the extension of George Padmore. We're the extension of Edward Wilmot Blyden. We're the extension of Du Bois. We're the extension of those who've been doing it for the longest time. And mm -hmm. so they think that through the advent of social media, people don't sit down and read a book anymore. They're gonna be fooled because you can put all the uh, current affairs in context. You're still gonna need a historical framework. Yes. Anything that they wanna focus on. And they think that through fast track propaganda, they can make you think that something happened a week ago happened 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. before you get a chance to make sense of it, they've moved on to another thing. They want to spread confusion around. But mm -hmm. what they're doing, it's not working. And every time they try to vilify a country, all it does is make people um, curious about the country. This is why whenever they target countries in Africa or the diaspora, we look at their positive attributes. And the reason we were trained because we looked at, let's go back to Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's nine years in Ghana. What did mm. they used to say, Dr. Tata? Oh, he, he, the reason that uh, he talks about this utopian concept of a united Africa, because he's negligent in the affairs of Ghana. The mm. man built se almost 70 factories in a nine year period a tire mm. factory, a cocoa factory, a rubber factory, a manganese mm. factory. Even Queen Elizabeth said, not that we needed her validation, but she said the roads of Ghana were better than the roads of London. So how, if you build nearly 70 factories in nine years, education is completely free, healthcare is completely free, you're on the verge of eradicating homelessness 100%, how are mm. you negligent of your country? But if people don't know that and if people aren't paying attention to that, you the fact that you can get them to entertain that for one second um they talk about Eri they talk about eritrea look what they're doing right now they're saying that eritreans are massacring the tigrian people those are their people they're the same people how would they right. benefit from massacring them they yes. are angry that ethiopia and eritrea have maintained a peace accord and they can't get any of those nations which they fascistly and racist in a very racist manner called tribes to suggest we're primitive. They can't get them to divide, divide. So they finally come together. They're one people, they're not gonna be broken. And it's in the most chaotic part of Africa where they've always been able to run amok in East Africa. So the last thing they wanna see is military stability in East Africa and Eritrea represents that. And this is a campaign to vilify the best fighting forces we have left. So they always say Zimbabwe needs to um, 
restructure its police and military. They say that Eritrea's um, military is out of control. Um, they, they are saying that Mozambique can't handle the situation that they're in right now. But there are five or six fighting forces on the continent that they're terrified of, and they want to continue to advance the agenda of the U.S. Africa Military Command in conjunction with the United States Agency for International Development. And more people are resisting it. And remember, Eritrea is the first nation to expel them on the African continent, to remove them off the African continent as early as 2005. And then mm -hmm. about five and a half years ago, Putin did the same thing in Russia. And the um, Bolivarian alliances for our, Alliance for Our Americas, which includes Cuba, and Bolivia and Venezuela, when Morales was still in power in um, Bolivia, and Haiti and Suriname, they said that they didn't want them in their countries anymore either. So um, they're so we they want to try to demilitarize us, but at the same time we're demilitarizing them. We we um, and and the thing about it is it's all the world is closing in on them. More more condemnation of Zionism in Israel, the the real nation's capital of the United States of America. And as Africans, we have a vested interest in that because um, Palestinian solidarity, that's only the tip of the iceberg for us. But when Algeria got their independence after fighting for eight years against France in an armed struggle, Zionist Israel was the only country to stand up in the UN and refuse to represent to recognize their self-determination. When Tunisia gained their independence, they did the same thing. Zionist Israel openly supported the apartheid regime in South Africa the Rhodesian regime in what is today Zimbabwe and Zambia, um, German colonialism isn't that isn't that wonderful? That while they've had the while they vilified Hitler to the world, they supported the German colonialists in Namibia who represented an extension of Hitler and represented the extension of not just Hitler but Otto von Bismarck, who was the facilitator of the Berlin Conference. We know our history. So, I mean, and so the fact is, so the crimes Israel has committed against the African continent, they have to answer for it. And here we are with this neo-colonialist African Union who has the audacity to give Israel observer status at the AU. Israel must be removed, this a observer status at the AU must be stripped immediately if we wanna show um, solidarity with the Palestinians. And most importantly, forget these artificial boundaries, Palestine is really North Africa. So every time Israel drops a bomb on Palestinian children, they're bombing Africa, just like when they bombed Syria and Egypt slash Kemet in 1967 during the Six Day War. So Israel is an enemy of the African world. It was a Zionist congressman in the US Congress named Tom Lantos that led the charge to bring about regime change in Zimbabwe, because he still had a hatred for Zimbabwe as ZANU-PF because of um, the going back to the days of the OAU Liberation Committee, where MPLA and ZANU and ZAPU and Free Limo used to meet in Ethiopia to give updates of the armed struggle. And that great um, humanitarian champion, Yasser Arafat, used to come and show his solidarity with us. So solidarity between Palestinians and Africans is an eternal thing. It's irreversible. But at the same time, it is time for Africans to raise their voice and call for Israel to have to answer for their crimes on the African continent, so-called sub-Saharan Africa, what white supremacists and racists call the dark side of the moon. We will not spare them either. So all of this is coming together. And interestingly enough, the only four or five countries you watch, and it's coming up in two weeks, there'll be another vote on the blockade on Cuba. And I guarantee you it will be the same handful of countries that vote are still in favor of that blockade. And Israel has consistently supported that monstrous blockade against the Cuban people to show favor to the United States. So anywhere in the world where Africans have progress, Africans have justice, Africans are on the way to redemption, Africans have a taste of real power, is Israel is standing in our way, be it on the continent or off the continent. So when people are surprised that we have this attitude towards Israel, we say, go back and look at the history of Israel's antagonistic, hateful relationship towards African people. And we dare them to respond anytime they're ready. But they must, the African Union, must strip them of their observer status at the AU. What are they there watching us for? 
That is a distinction for friends. That is a distinction for allies. And that is proven on, by your actions and your deeds. What has Zionist Israel done to deserve observer status at the African Union? And this is the best time to bring this up since South Africa is the chair of the African Union because the ANC, the PAC, Azapo, the EFF, all those organizations in South Africa, be it the ruling party and the others, they know the role that Israel has played in the suffering of their people directly and the region. So this would be the perfect time to bring that up, to say, get them out of our meetings, get them out of our business. That's too close for comfort. Just go on. I mean, yeah. So, 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 of course. I mean, these are these are the things, and of course, I mean, I'm on this platform right here, so you know we have to speak to this. Mm. When did we give these neo-colonialist governments the right to say that African Liberation Day is no more, and they came back with this watered down um, interpretation of that experience called Africa Day, mm. and they say formally known as African Liberation Day? Are we liberated? Are we unified? Are we masters of our own destiny? So until that day, we are in pursuit of total liberation. We don't have total liberation. Of course, we are. it brings tears to our eyes when we think of what happened, how we dismantled settler colonialism, which all the way up till 1994, from the day that Ghana did it, March 6, 1957. We're proud of that achievement, but we have so much to do when dealing with neocolonialism military neocolonialism and now civilian neocolonialism. We neutralize MPLA, relief. We neutralize Renamo, relief. We got rid of Mobutu, relief. Hufed Boini passed away, relief. Compre was moved, removed from power in Burkina Faso, relief. But they, but we're still dealing with civilian neocolonialism. Look at the trouble that the MDC is causing in Zimbabwe. So we are still dealing with civilian neocolonialism. Look at the, the, the problems that these neocolonialist governments in Africa are causing today. So as long as they're at the helm of power, as long as we have heads of state that wake up and before they even brush their teeth, they're worried about what they can do to make France happy, what they can do to make the Republicans and Democrats in the United States happy, what they can do to make Britain happy. As long as we have that dynamic, how can we have the audacity to come before anyone anywhere and say that we are free? So why would they insult us and say and remove liberation from African Liberation Day? Especially if you know the history, some of your watchers may not know it. At the Council of Independent African States, the ones we had in April 15, 1958 in Ghana, that's when we decided to celebrate African Freedom Day. That lasted for five years. Then at the creation of the Organization of African Unity, a compromise to prevent one unified socialist Africa, we said, okay, we'll change it in African Liberation Day. But when did it become okay for these neo-colonialist governments to remove, extract the word liberation? And many people who don't know the history are following along with them, Dr. Tata. And then yeah. in the United States, for example, and other places in the diaspora, we have a dynamic now where people celebrate Kwanzaa. Beautiful mm -hmm. holiday, beautiful holiday. Very spiritual in its expression, very cultural in its expression, very organic in its expression. But the same people who celebrate Kwanzaa they go in hiding like they're on the FBI and CIA's fugitive list when African Liberation Day doesn't comes around and they don't celebrate African Liberation Day. They don't pass that history down to our children. This is why through our theater company, the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company, four out of the last five years, we have had a play on African Liberation Day. Hmm. Next, ne In the next couple of days in the United States, we will be celebrating something called Juneteenth when yes. Texas became the last state to end our captivity. But the people who will aggressively celebrate Juneteenth will not celebrate the day of the African child. Mm -hmm. On the continent, we will be celebrating the day of the African child and won't say anything about Juneteenth. Why can't mm -hmm. we bring those two things together? Absolutely. We must merge our experiences. There's yes. no reason why. We did a play called the National Associate, I'm um, called The Sisters Touch and Struggle. Um, one of my um, parents and students are watching right now. They just text me on the phone. And mm -hmm. um, we did a play about an organization called the National Association of Colored Women. 
Harriet Tubman is a founding member. Ida B. Wells is a founding member. Mm -hmm. Mary Church Terrell is a founding member. The third mm -hmm. wife of Booker T. Washington, Margaret Murray Washington. This is the 125th anniversary of that organization. But the reason that we did that is because this is the International Year of Women, and we know that we're still a matrilineal people. This is one of the most positive and uplifting aspects of our culture and our collective experience. So this is the reason that we do that. So um, in the midst of doing that, and then last year before the pandemic hit, we had four plays. One was supposed to be done in Haiti. One was supposed to be done in the Congo. One was supposed to be done in the United States. The one we did in the United, we're going to do in the United States, we're going to end up doing, and it's called, it was called Ready for the Revolution. And it was about um, Akme Sekouture and Mbalia Kamara, who was the leader of the women in the Guinean Revolution. Um, and we did a play um, it, during Kwanzaa called the Key Swahili Explosion, where, mm. it was, um, where it was homeless children in Tanzania that were calling for all the 14 million homeless children in Eastern Africa were coming together and they were calling on the Africans in the United States to celebrate Kwanzaa since they communicate in Swahili. And since our people in the United States are between 12 and 15% of the population, but 43% of the homeless within North American borders, this is something that we can connect to. We did mm -hmm. another play, I'm, and I'm just giving an example of these Pan-African parallels. And, oh, getting back to the National Association of Colored Women, that was created in 1896, which was the same year that Mbuya Nehanda organized a armed revolt in Zimbabwe, which was the same year that Booker T. Washington um, hired George Washington Carver at Tuskegee University, which was the same year that the National Medical Association was created because our people were not allowed to join, there were doctors could not join the American Medical Association, because the American Medical Association's attitude was, you're only 33 years removed from picking cotton and picking tobacco. Why would I let you touch my body? So they had this racist white supremacist disposition. But in the spirit of self-determination, our sisters and brothers at the time, they formed their own organization. So um, we felt that 1896 was an excellent year to connect. We have another play, for example, we did a few years ago. We did it for my son's welcoming called Araminta and Samora treating the sick, liberating the oppressed. For those of you who don't know, the first um, president of Mozambique, the great Samora Marshall, he was mm -hmm. a nurse. His middle name is Moises, which is how they say Moses in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So he was a liberator, just like Harriet Tubman. He was a nurse, just like Harriet Tubman. And if you know the history of the liberation struggle in Mozambique, they had to design an escape route to get from Mozambique to Tanzania so that you could join Free Limo, the Revolutionary Front for the Liberation of Mozambique, and go through training. They patterned their escape route from Mozambique to Tanzania after studying the Underground Railroad. So these connections and to teach this to children and to make sure that our children begin the decolonization process as early as possible which requires that we treat social science with the same courtesy that we treat natural science or math. Mm. If you go through a math book and they give you a wrong problem, they'll take the book off the shelf. The same thing with a science book. But it is only in history that we allow inaccuracies and lies and overflated opinions that have no substance and have no basis to continue to see the light of day. So why would we allow these neo-colonialist governments in Africa to say that African Liberation Day with that wording should no longer be celebrated? And this was a holiday, and this was a day when we brought together liberation movements still fighting for their independence, revolutionary governments who were trying to stay in power people who represented struggles that we were in solidarity with. This is how we were introduced to the Palestinians. This is how we were introduced to the Irish. This is how we were introduced to the Vietnamese. This is how we were introduced to other struggles. And when it comes to revolutionary solidarity, identifying allies who have a similar history from you is not a departure from nationalism. It is not a departure from Pan-Africanism. When you intensify war against your enemy, allies are always advantageous as long as the alliances are organic and natural and sincere. And anytime that things happen to sabotage the relationship, that's when we have a concern. So let me, and this is something that we're dealing with right now because you have people who are agents and extended mouthpieces for the United States interest in Africa who are attacking the Chinese, but they're not attacking the Chinese because they are disappointed with some of the isolated incidents we've seen. They're carrying out the agenda of the Corporate Council on Africa. They're carrying out the agenda of the Council of Foreign Relations. 
So that when it is when the time is necessary, we will sit down with the Chinese and iron out the things we're concerned about. But we're not going to attack the Chinese to create a climate where it makes it seem like we're in harmony with the United States interest. Because you have to remember when the Obama administration on its way out had a summit where they invited all these African leaders, the number one item on the agenda was asking these African nations to break ties with China. Mm. Um, in 2005, when Zimbabwe's um, 25th anniversary of independence, President Mugabe introduced the Look East policy and the State Department in Washington had an emergency meeting. So these isolated incidents of racism and hatred that the Chinese, certain Chinese individuals are carrying out, it does concern us. But under no circumstances will we allow these isolated incidents to be the reason that we echo the rhetoric, sentiment, and propaganda of the United States and European Union. We have to be very careful with that. Yes, Sante. And, and if the Chinese have recognized that legacy and would like to break ties with us, then we'll break ties with dignity. But until it has been established that that has become the normal trend and these are not isolated incidents, I urge people who are not informed to pay attention to where your sources of information are coming from. If you're regurgitating what's in foreign policy magazine, if you are regurgitating what is in US News and World Report, if you are regurgitating what is on CNN, what is on BBC, what is the vo in the Voice of America, be very careful what you're spreading. Be very careful what you're spreading. And that, and that um, is in line with everything else. So many of us who will say with confidence we're we embrace the path of liberation, when it comes to interpretation of developments, we have a tendency to still lean on the narrative of our former colonizers and kidnappers. Absolutely. And that has to stop. So on that particular question, and then remember, this is in the scheme of a bigger thing. We, we've always made a distinction between South Koreans who are US puppets and North Koreans who are revolutionary and anti-imperialists. We make a distinction between the Vietnamese who are committed to the legacy of Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese who fought with the United States. Why would we be any different with the Chinese? They are Chinese that are true to the legacy of Mao Zedong. They are Chinese who have recognized who, who the dollar has become their God. It's only natural that that was going to happen. We will make the adjustments. But at the same time, it's about what these neo-colonialist governments in Africa are doing. That is our number one priority. Ending neo-colonialism in Africa, military neo-colonialism or civilian neo-colonialism. It has existed for too long. It has existed for too long. And you have a whole new generation of people who've embraced the paradigm. Hufed Boini is gone. Bukasa is gone. Mobutu is gone. Musa Traore is gone. But there are people now who are trying to turn back the clock and implement policies that are an extension of their aspirations. And on the and in the diaspora, this is very important because we're in a fight now, which we've been in for the last 40 years, where we don't want to start our history in chains coming off of ships being kid being kidnapped. Mm. But it, so what they're doing is they're taking us back to the feudal era. So Huffington Post deliberately did an article a few years ago saying Mansa Musa is the richest man in the history of the human race. He was worth $400 billion. So young people in Mali, young people in Burkina Faso, young people in Senegal and so-called Francophone West Africa, they could, they could aspire to be like Mansa Musa instead of um, Modibo Keita, a revolutionary who wanted to share all of Mali with Malians. Mm. They would so they'd rather have you be like a king or rather have you be like a queen, a modern day monarch, instead mm -hmm. of someone who is committed to a society where we share the wealth and a society that accepts the doctrine that the human resource is the most precious resource we have available. That's so we will not use the material resources to abuse the human resource. Oh, and yes. that is what they're afraid of. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so when we talk about this, and it was in Krumah, Osajifo, Dr. Kwame and Krumah, that told, that told us, he said, socialism and African unity are organically complementary. I didn't say Marxism, Leninism. I didn't say Maoism. I said socialism based on our own culture, us sharing. 
And this is why we don't talk about the communal Africa. We keep talking about the feudal Africa. And we mm -hmm. let these chiefs in neo-colonialist tradition continue to abuse power and they help compromise the integrity of every nation on the African continent right now. The revolutions that we have waged in all these countries, they were for the maids, they were for the gardeners, they were for the drivers, they were for the everyday people, they were for the poorest of the poor, they were for the villagers. That's who we fought for, that's who we've given our lives for, not for privileged classes of people, not for privileged yeah. cliques of people. Our revolution yeah. never has been about that. And if after all these years, the people who are supposed to benefit the most, if they're still suffering the most, then it shows you how much work we have to do. Oh, and yes. at a time right now where we have to clearly let people know, not just what we're against, but what we're fighting for, what we're fighting for. And when you start to talk about what you're fighting for, some of the loudest voices become very soft. And mm. then because they realize that they're really not committed to the path of revolution. Share the gold with everyone? How is that possible? Share the diamonds with everyone? How is that possible? Education for everyone? How is that possible? Food for everyone? How is that possible? Empowering our women to the maximum? Are we sure we're ready for that? And they'll be the main ones who come up with reasons why we shouldn't aggressively pursue these things. <laughs> and this is why, and, and, and we have seen that continue, but we're on top of it now. We're, we're ready. Our people, we can tell by the young people. We can tell by the young adults. We can tell by the elderly who, have, who give us wisdom through their experiences. Our people are ready for that fundamental change. And no longer are we preoccupied by the hang up that we're going to stop this fight because we're not going to live long enough to see these things happen. Mm -hmm. Emil Cargabral didn't live to see Guinea-Bissau liberated. Josiah Tongo Gara didn't live to see Zimbabwe liberated. Mm -hmm. um, Eduardo Monlane didn't live to see Mozambique liberated. But everything they did was to move things in that direction, to create that climate and atmosphere. So the culture of selflessness, the culture of sacrifice, that's the most positive aspect of our culture. Why would we run away from it? We're running to it. And they're trying to do everything they can to prevent it from happening, but they're fighting a losing battle and they understand they're fighting a losing battle. And right now, whoever's hearing me that is connected to everyday people, you have this conversation amongst everyday people. They say they resonate, it resonates with them. They want to see this fundamental change take place because the most exploited, the most raped, the most abused, the most plundered continent and the most dispersed people on earth are more deserving than anyone else on the earth right now. African liberation is the key to world peace, mm. to world peace. Because mm. if the most exploited people in the world are able to break that cycle, how could the rest of the world not benefit from it? The mm. only people who would be against it are those who benefit from their exploitation. They're the only ones. Who would not cheer that embraces justice and peace when Africa finally gets itself together in a real way, in a tangible way, in a meaningful way? And we've had so many models of isolated places who've shown us the way. The three years Sama Sankara was in power is a model. The year Sekou Toure was in power in Guinea, we can take the extract a lot from that. In mm -hmm. Krumah's time, Samora Marshall's time, what they're doing in Zimbabwe right now, there's many things that we can extract that the rest of, that other places have not had a chance to experience yet that would resonate with the masses of their people. Who would not want to be able to farm to feed themselves and not have to worry about begging Western donors mm. for bread, for fruit, for soup? Who would, who would be against that? Who would be against schools in every village? Who would be against hospitals in every village? Who would be against healthcare being free for everyone, education free for everyone, the most quality education? Who would be who would be against Africans in the diaspora coming back, not with a superiority complex thinking that they're destined to lead, but just coming to humbly play their role in the ground? Who would have a problem with that? Nobody. Once it's explained. Who would have a problem with creating political parties that we all belong to regardless of our religious and spiritual beliefs, regardless mm. of our agenda? Who would have a problem with that? 
they put this thing on us, Dr. Tata, 30 years ago, multi-party democracy, one-party democracy. How can you tell us that it's not democratic to have one party that everyone calls their own? How is that not democratic? That, re that represents true unity. The only problem is you don't control it. The only problem is you can't install opposition to it that is going to try to sabotage everything that the people are committed to building. Mm -hmm. Why did we abandon the one party? For what? There's no justification for it. Mm. But they were able to convince us. They tell us that our economic models don't work. How have their economic models served us? And you're already hearing people say socialism doesn't work. Well, cap, and the problem is capitalism has worked too well. That's why you got 400 million people living on a dollar 90 cents a day. It's worked perfectly. It's set up to create that objective. And for the record, they are, they're not even 3,000 billionaires on the whole earth, but then nearly 500 million people that live on a dollar 90 cents a day. The gap between the wealthy and the impoverished is wider than it's been in the history of humanity. This cannot continue. And Africa definitely has something to say about it. And Africa's response is going to be the most aggressive and the most militant. And they have nightmares about it every single day. Even when we go back to the kidnapping of our ancestors, what's the most upsetting thing about that? It interrupted a struggle we were having with ourselves. Before the first Arab or first white man touched foot in Africa, we were telling these kings and queens, no, the wealth has to be shared with all of us. You don't get to have it all and give it to us when you want. No, we were about to go to all our war over that. But it was interrupted by outsiders. So now the outsiders, they, they still control things from a distance. But now we have to look at a Kufa Ado in the face and say, no. We have to look the rest of these people in the face and say, no, we choose the path we were on 50, 60 years ago, because it was uncompromising. It was self-determining. That's what we're choosing. And you can't convince us that what you are offering works because we see the lack of results. Revolution, struggle, resistance, it's a result. This is all about results. It's not about sentiment. Correct. We are looking at the results. So we know what's in our best interest. And we're tired of seeing people sacrifice everything for us. We allow them to be villainized, we are vilified, we allow them to be dehumanized. And then 20 years after their death, 30 years after their death, 40 years after their death, 50 years after their death, we come and say, you know, they were right the whole time. Yes. We're not yeah. doing that anymore either. Mm -mm. We're not doing that anymore. You've seen enough examples from the past to know how you should be fighting presently for the purpose of dictating our future. And for those who are not committed to it, those who want to maintain this masquerade, you want to pretend to fight, that's not going to work either. Putting on a red tam on your head does not make you Thomas Sankara. Correct. Your actions do. Your deeds do. Your service does. So speaking at conferences, banging on the podium, screaming at the top of your lungs, that doesn't impress us. It's what you do off that podium. Sankara himself said our revolution is not a public speaking tournament. Why, why are there so many conferences with so many people speaking about things that they haven't executed? Hmm. And when they're talking to you, they're telling you about how they feel about things. They're not telling you about practical things they've done, practical things they're doing. Wow. So the, the, that so the whole that whole subculture, that opportunity subculture, it's come to an end. It's time for something different. Why do we can why do we need to continue to have all these high profile conferences? Why can't we just have private meetings where people put their work on the table, where they can show mm. the results of their work? Yes. People talk about our children all the time. We'll be glad to come. Name the place and time and show you what we're doing with the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company. And mm -hmm. we're confident that when more people hear about it, they'll say, we need that in Mali. We need that in Senegal. We need that here. We need that there. And not only that, then we'll meet the people who are doing that same work too. And they'll say, we can partner together. And then every time we perform, they can perform and we'll support each other's efforts. The people who are really doing the work are the people you don't hardly see. 
But the reason is because they're not preoccupied with being visible. They're preoccupied with being productive and impactful. Absolute. Oh, God. You don't have to, if, if, because if I'm spending all my time on, on YouTube, if I'm spending all my time on Facebook, Conventional wisdom and logic, someone will say, well, wow, if he's always talking, when is he doing this work he's talking about? Yes. You understand? So these are the things in our people's intelligence, our people's ingenuity, our people's common sense. It's heightened, it's escalated, it's skyrocketed. They can see through the masquerade and the fraud. The only thing is, how do we go about on a practical level? Matter of fact, you know what we're living through, Dr. Tata? We're living through the bastardization of methodology. People hide behind ideologies and mm. never get to execute what they're talking about. That's why Cuba is loved and revered everywhere. They right. don't go around giving speeches on the um, legacy of Karl Marx. They make it. They make their revolution practical. You see what their doctors do. You see what their engineers do. You see what their scientists do. And they can explain to you why they're so committed to their way of life. It isn't just the treatment. When they're treating that wound and they're treating that cut and they're explaining to you their healthcare system, when they're explaining to you that green medicine is part of their national health policy, wh where won't that resonate in Africa? And then the children are sitting around watching them treat their parents or the children are sitting there watching this doctor treat them that's so patriotic to their nation. Mm. And then that young person is saying, you know, I can be a doctor like this. I can yes. be a nurse like this. Mm. And then we get more Augustino Nitos. We get mm. more Franz Fanon's. We get more Samuel Paranyatwas, who was the number two person in the first liberation movement in Zimbabwe, Zapu. He was assassinated by the Rhodesians. In the United States, we'll get more Charles Drews, more Daniel Hale Williams, more Ernest Everett Just, people who have these skills but are driven by the fighting spirit. And we benefit from their skills and talents and our enemies do not. So this is why the practical aspects of things are, are important. And you notice when you interview people, they don't talk about what they do. They talk about how they feel. We have to change that. And this is why even when we talk about certain historical figures, we quote them, but we don't talk about the work they did. Correct. How, you know what I mean? So it makes it seem like they spent all their time going around giving speeches, which is Egg. completely Egg. not the truth. Correct. So, so the reason people listen to Robert Mugabe because his educational system showed his commitment to self-determination. Mm. Their healthcare system showed that. Their agricultural system showed that. Mm. It, what Nkrumah was doing with industrialization, it demonstrated. What Sekou Toure was able to do with the arts in Guinea, what he was able to do with the people's militia, the first nation in Africa to arm the entire people and tell the people they are the army, they are the Navy, they are the Air Force, they are the Marines. No one can protect the country better than them. How can that responsibility be left to a handful of soldiers? Mm. So the practical things these people, these, these leaders did, these movements did, these organizations did, why do we still talk about great freedom fighters in isolation from their organizations? Every time we bring them up, we should bring up the organization they represented. So people Absolutely. will go out there and learn about the organization and then mm. say to themselves, man, I can build an organization like that right now in my country right now in my neighborhood, right now in my community, since there doesn't appear to be one that's like it. Mm. So we begin to pattern ourselves after the organizations and the organizers that we admire and respect the most. This is what they're terrified of everywhere, especially in Africa and, and in the diaspora too, it's the same thing. Someone made a comment, I look like a Black Panther. My father started the Panthers in London in the 1960s. But there are people who think the Panthers was just something that happened in the United States. We had Panthers in Australia, Panthers in India, Panthers in the Middle East. They were Panthers everywhere because black power hit and it scared colonialism and imperialism everywhere. In Zimbabwe, the Rhodesians banned the book Black Power and they banned my father's book too about the black power movement in London. They didn't even want them to talk about it because at the same time, when black power was first beginning to be propagated in 1966, 67, 68, this is when these liberation movements in Africa had taken up arms. 
And the liberation movements in Southern Africa scared them so much, Dr. Tata, because if you look at them, many of their leaders went to university at Fort Hare in South, what's called South Africa. Mm. And when you, were, when you were studying in Fort Hare in the 1940s, they gave you Mahatma Gandhi overkill. So you were supposed to be a pacifist. So in the 1940s, the 1950s, they were learning about Gandhi. By the 1960s, they were ready to take up arms. So they knew that. So, so they could no longer contain us by trying to give us a, a, um, a pacifist narrative on how to protest oppression. We decided that arms was more befitting. So Brother Malcolm was correct when he said, by all means necessary. So when we need to arm ourselves, we'll arm ourselves. But when we can use demonstrations, strikes, and boycotts and protests that are revolutionary and uncompromising, we will do it there too. And the biggest fear that the United States has right now is as more Africans go to the continent and they begin to see the um, atrocities they've committed on the continent, we can have protests at US embassies all over Africa at the same time we're marching in the United States. And why would the Africans and the rest of the Americas not join? Why won't the Africans in Venezuela say, my time, the Africans in um, Nicaragua, the Africans in Bolivia, the Africans in Cuba? We're coming together. Even the, even the Democrat and Republicans definition of America is being challenged before, more than ever before. Who the hell are they to say they're America? That's worse than Hitler's Nazi party or Mussolini's fascist party. There's North America, South America, Central America, Latin America, and it's nearly 200 million of us in the Americas. Why would we cut ourselves off from the rest of our people in the Americas? Why would we cut ourselves off from Africa? And we've always back and forth, always inspired each other. When Dr. King was sitting in jail in Birmingham and wrote that letter, you know what he said? He said, man, we're sitting here trying to fight against modern day segregation. We're moving like a horse attached to a buggy. You know how heavy a buggy was on the shoulders of a horse. Yeah. He said in Africa, they're moving at it like a jet. In 1811, they had a revolution, an uh, armed rebellion in New Orleans, Louisiana. A man named Charles Durslans led that. You know what they were fighting for? They were fighting to establish an all African Republic in New Orleans because they saw what happened in Haiti seven years before. And there are times in Africa, they're inspired by what they see us do in the diaspora. It goes back and forth. How many Africans came to school in the United States and London were introduced to struggle and went back to their countries and became liberators? Maurice Bishop learned about black power and resistance while studying law in London and went back to Grenada and organized the most important revolution since the Haitian and Cuban revolution in the Caribbean. So there was a time when the brain drain was beneficial to us because those people who left their nations and went to the diaspora to their former colonizers house to be educated, they knew they were coming home to bring about changes. Mm -hmm. And this speaks to the quote unquote immigration dynamic that you hear people talk about in the United States. There, there is no immigration crisis if you are a regime change agent. If you come from Zimbabwe and you say, I'm here to help you get rid of Manangagwa and ZANU-PF, they'll let you right in. You come here from Cuba and say, I'm sick of that revolution. I miss the days of Batista. They'll let you right in. You come here from Venezuela and say, I want to help you get rid of Maduro. I'm sick and tired of this talk about an Afro-descendant movement uniting Africans all over the Americas. They can get right in. You come here from Eritrea and say, I hate this Afworky guy. I want to help you get rid of him. They'll let you right in. So if you come here willing to work with them to work for the demise of your nation, you experience no obstacles. You experience no bureaucracy. You are well. You are just. You are as welcomed in the U.S. if you're a regime change agent as a Christian is in a Christian church or a Muslim is in a mosque, and they know it. So when we're focusing on that question, that never comes up. And this reverses the trend. So even when Obama started that Young African Leadership Institute, what was the purpose of that? So you have no more Nkrumahs. You have no more Eduardo Marlanes. You have no more Maurice Bishops. You have no more Amilcar Cabral's, people who travel to the lands of their former colonizers for education and then end up giving all of their labor to you and not to their people. That is the cycle that they're trying to break. And it's the cycle that we're trying to reintroduce. So it's cultural warfare. 
And I think a lot of people don't understand that aspect of culture. Uh, Emil Cabral said liberation itself is an act of culture. Sekouture expanded on that. Achmed Sekouture, he said, culture is the sum total of the spiritual and material values obtained by humanity throughout its history. What does that mean? So when we talk about police terrorism in the United States, it's not legal. It's not political. It's cultural. They cannot exist without police terrorism. So when you say you're trying to end it or eradicate it, you're saying that the United States government has, must cease to, to exist. Even if you don't realize you're saying that, they do. They do. So you're calling for a, a fundamental change of values. When you're calling for a fundamental change of values, you are calling for the overthrow of the existing political order, the existing economic order, the existing military order. That, that's why when we say what we're fighting for, a lot of people don't understand that or overlook that or downplay that or don't want to go on record because they don't want to be associated with being committed to that objective because they know about the persecution that comes with the territory and they may not be ready to handle it. But at the same time, they know. So this is, this, this is, this is what we're saying. So when we say we're talking about dealing with police terrorism, we're de gentrification, um, urban renewal, as they call it, um, health disparities where the wealthy get all the health care and the poor get nothing. You're calling for the most fundamental change there is, even if you don't realize it. So this is a time for us to really reflect, to really concentrate, to be tolerant of e each other's ideas, to be objective, to be more appreciative, and to look at what all of us bring to the table at this point. And, to, uh, and the most important thing is to make sure that we are the beneficiaries of our resistance, mm -hmm. not, our en not our enemies. You know who benefited um, most from the activity centered around what happened to George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery? Joe Biden. The same way when we were children, young in the 1990s, after we brought the country to a complete halt, Bill Clinton, the Rodney King rebellions, as they're called in the history books, Bill Clinton benefited from it more than we did. Absolutely. And that's the other thing, too. We have to decide if we're fighting for power or for justice. If we're fighting for power, you know that those who want you to fight for justice will become your enemies mm. because they don't want you to see any examples of power anywhere in the world. Joe Biden is the main person looking to overthrow the Zimbabwean government. He's one, the original co, one of the original co-sponsors, him and Hillary Clinton, of the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act. And get this, a cuddly old white liberal named Bernie Sanders as a congressman in Vermont, he was in favor of those sanctions too. So as sympathetic as they try to act like they are, they don't want to see you in power. Biden has been planning the overthrow of the Eritrean government. He is more hell-bent on overthrowing Maduro in Venezuela than Donald Trump was. So this is someone that our people are so invested in. But he can only get away with that if we continue to promote the amputated narrative of our experience, where we talk about North America in isolation from South America or the Caribbean or Latin America or Africa. So we're pan-Africanizing everything, our mm. spiritual practice, our music, everything. Mm. So they can't, they can't do anything about it. And then when we go back and look at the people who we admire the most, they were doing this before us. I was looking at something. I was sharing it with some people the other day. You know who wrote Lyndon Johnson? After Ian Smith introduced the concept of the Universal Declaration of Independence in Rhodesia, you know who contacted Lyndon Johnson within 24 hours and said, if you don't break ties with Ian Smith, we're going to have protests all over this country? Dr. Martin Luther King called Lyndon Johnson and said that. He said, it's no way you can support Rhodesia. But people may not know that. When John Carlos and Tommy Smith did the Black Power Salute in Mexico, the main demand on their agenda was Avery Brundage be removed from the um, Olympic Committee because he was a supporter of Rhodesia and a supporter of South apartheid in South Africa. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that's known for uh, introducing black power to the 1960s generation, known for introducing um, 
the hell no, we won't go slogan and later coming out saying they wanted the Vietnamese to win when they found out that Ho Chi Minh said he was inspired by the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. They went to Zambia for a conference talking about the connection between segregation and apartheid. We've always looked to close the gap. Always look to close the gap. We're not coming together for the first time. Even people, and so even when we teach our children about Africa, the first thing we do, Dr. Tata, is we teach them about the ties that the people who they do know about have to Africa. Did you know that Thurgood Marshall wrote Kenya, helped write Kenya's constitution? Every time they bring up that he's the first African to be a Supreme Court justice or the work he did on the Brown versus Board of Education case, that should come up. And it's important because he put a measure in there that we had to buy our land back. You couldn't just show up on your grandmother's land or great grandmother's land and tell those British that they needed to exit the um, premises. And he said he was proud of that. We've mm. been singing a song since the 1920s in the United States called Lift Every Voice and Sing, a beautiful song. The very last, but they don't let us sing the third verse, the final verse. The very last line of the song is true to our God, true to our native land. If they're saying our native land, is our native land Virginia? Is our native land Alabama? Is our native land Mississippi? Is our native land North Carolina? Is our native land Haiti? Is our native land of the Dominican Republic? No, our native land is those 55 nations of Mother Africa. So even then, they were pushing us in that direction. So yeah, so so every so things are move things are moving in the direction they need to move in. We just have to urge our people to be patient and not to be discouraged. And it is intentional for idiots to have maximum platforms to spread confusion. It is their job. There's no reason to get upset about it. There's no reason get upset about it for what? It should inspire you to do your mm -hmm. job to carry out your responsibility. They're supposed to lie on the news. Absolutely. Their political yes. parties are supposed to abuse their authority. They're supposed to try to manipulate the situation. Their, humani their, their, their vehicles oh. that peddle humanitarian aid are supposed to do that. We just have to stop them. Everything they're doing, they're supposed to do. We're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. And the one thing that we know, the world isn't big enough for the both Absolutely. of us. All these people that are treating the assassination of Malcolm X like an Al Alfred Hitchcock um, television show or Agatha Christie novel, they're supposed to. Malcolm wasn't the last freedom fighter that they've snatched from us. He wasn't the first one and he won't be the last one. How do we deal with that moving forward? Are we going to create a climate and atmosphere to force the CIA to pull the plug, the FBI to pull the plug? Or are we just going to continue to complain about their atrocities? That's the other thing. We have to change this narrative of victimization to a narrative of resistance. Playing the yes. victim, to, 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 because if you yes. talk too much about the wickedness of your enemy, the atrocities of your enemy, you end up accidentally immortalizing the enemy. And we've defeated them too many times Correct. to present them like they're immortal. Why would we present them like they're immortal? How many times have we whipped them? The only thing we haven't done is have the ultimate victory, but all the small victories we've had, very significant ones. And every time we did it, they didn't see it coming. They didn't see Haiti coming in the 1800s. They didn't see Mozambique, Zambia, um, Zimbabwe coming. They didn't see Nkrumah coming in Ghana. They didn't see Lumumba coming in the Congo. They didn't see Mark Michael Manley coming in Jamaica. The element of surprise is the Africans' best weapon. We don't need to show them everything. If they, if they, they want to say we're stupid, okay, fine. They want to say we're disorganized, fine. They want to say we've given up. They want to say we've completely capitulated. They can say what they want to say. That shouldn't impact on how we approach the business of struggle. Let them mm. say what they want to say. And then that way it's more sweeter when we make the breakthroughs that are necessary. This is why oh, we're yes. saying, if we are able by the end of this year to get thousands of Africans in the diaspora to say, you know what, man, I'm Ghanaian. I've never done anything for my country. You let those Cuban doctors know anything they want. I'm giving it to them. 
The mm. same thing in Tanzania, the same thing with the South Africans in the diaspora. Africans born in the diaspora who ain't never been home will say, you know what? I feel a sense of responsibility. I feel a sense of purpose. And before you know it, we have created an alternative to the United States Agency for International Development, to the Bush Foundation, at a time where you have African heads of state acting like Bush's foundation represents the reincarnation of Jesus based on biblical mythology. I respect Festus Mohai very much, the former Botswanan president, but he said Bush has done more for Africa than any um, former U.S. president. The largest highway in Ghana is named after George Bush, not Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. What the hell is wrong with us? But let's have an alternative to his foundation. We can do it. Why can't we do that? And give it to Cuba because they've earned it. And we know there's some of you because they've been saying it to me the last year, Dr. Tata. Oh, well, you know, the, the, the racism in Cuba. Show me a place in the Americas where Europeans and Africans coexist, where racism doesn't exist. That's not the issue. The issue is the steps that are being taken to eradicate it. And there is no country in the Americas where our people were kidnapped and brought that has done more to eradicate racism than Cuba. The Africans that we, at the concert we did, when people saw all these artists doing hip hop, doing salsa, doing jazz, doing blues, doing gospel, we jokingly said, how racist of them to use their resources to empower all these Africans artistically. The face of their space program is an African. The, the first poet laureate of the country, Nicholas Guillen, who they used to call the Langston Cues of Cuba, is an African. The largest statue in Cuba mm -hmm. is of Antonio Maceo, who was called the Bronze Titan, who fought during the Spanish-American War. The first all-African political party in the Western Hemisphere was in Cuba in 1908. There's a statue honoring those Africans called Partido Independiente de Colo in the Independent Party of Color. What right, so what do you, Asada Shakur is safe in Cuba because of their commitment to African people. Mm. So, the, so when people just say these things, it, it, it's to discourage people. And those who are saying this, all we're telling you is to be careful because we're trying to send young people to Cuba to be trained medically, to come back to the mm. poorest parts of the United States, the poorest parts of the Caribbean and the poorest parts of Africa to treat their people. We don't need you putting doubts in their head. There was even a, a communique, a Ghanaian student was in Cuba, medical student, and he was playing basketball. He got sick, he died. And they started talking about the negligence of Cubans towards Ghanaians. That was by design. Because if you know the history, the first leader in Africa to come out in support of Cuba was in Osage for Dr. Nkrumah. And then Gamal Abdel Nasser the very next day. So you're now going after Ghanaian Cuban solidarity. Good luck with that. And if anybody knows the impact of the blockade, it is impacted on everything in that country. Their ambulatory care. And even in spite of this, they're doing these this marvelous work in the field of healthcare. But they are setbacks occasionally. But for the National Union of Ghanaian Students to open their mouth the way they did, prop under the instructions of the United States, more than likely. And that's all they can do because do you think that they're going to, um, Ghanaian students in Ghana are not going to go to Cuba for medical school when they have the opportunity? Do you think the Cuban doctors are going to stop coming to Ghana? But this is what they were trying to do. So they try to exploit the situation. And they're always trying to exploit situations. And, and they think that this is going to help Doctors Without Borders and the Gates Foundation and all these other imperialist outlets to, to, to be the face of um, human, a humanitarian turnaround. How can mm -hmm. those who rape and plunder you be responsible for your humanitarian turnaround? Their culture is based on raping and plundering you, exploiting you, preventing you from being self-determinant. How can they now come and change that? So these are one of the, these are the type of things that um, we 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 are paying attention to and, and we're dealing with, and um, it's okay. I mean, so the decolonization process is going to take place, and um, 
we we want to build on what people have done before us. So um, like, for example, the play we told you about the key Swahili explosion, where we were mm -hmm. dealing with homeless children in East Africa. One of the reasons I wanted to always do a play in key Swahili is because about eight years ago, out there's a school called Nation House in DC, one of the powerhouse African independent schools. And they were doing Julius Caesar in key Swahili. So it, it threw me off. But then I went and read right away and found out that Walimu Julius Nerere um, wrote, rewrote Julius Caesar word for word in Key Swahili. Mm. Now, based on the tradition of the Roman Empire, okay, but they, he could have used um, plays from the Harlem Renaissance, from mm. the Black Arts Movement instead. But once again, instead of focusing on that, we said, okay, let us do a play in Key Swahili that deals with a pressing geopolitical need a pressing geopolitical challenge. And that's the way that we, we approach that situation. And, um, you know, so that's what it is. And that's the other thing. We have to break this cycle of the social critic. People who, um, you know, we joke, Dr. Tata and say, we were practicing social distancing long before the Corona pandemic. They were people who always stayed away from the battlefield, always stayed away from the front line, always stayed away from our organizations. Mm. And but they all of a sudden want to be experts on our struggle, but don't really want to be in our struggle. And part of this is to boost their academic career or, or mm. boost their journalistic career. Correct. But they're really not. But they're really not committed to organized resistance at all. As a matter of fact, mm. they become watchdogs. If they're professors on college campuses, their job is to keep people like us off their campuses. If they're in churches, it's to prevent churches from embracing programs to deal with what we're talking about. Correct. If they have artistic organizations, it's to focus on culture on the surface in the most superficial way, mm. but never to deal, but to never deal with intensifying our resistance. So we we understand we understand what we're up against. So there's a certain level of organization that's required. There's a certain level of quality communication that's required. But we're, but you know, we're just optimistic. We we really are, and um, we we just feel that we can't be stopped right now, because our people, and maybe it's because I'm around children all the time, and I'm not talking about um, uh, millennials, because some people say that sometimes. I'm talking about eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Those are my comrades at this particular moment. So those are the people around. And when they get exposure to this history and I see how they digest it and I see how they embrace it. And the strategic reason for that is because the whole, the concept of the mass emphasis, positive action and creativity um, youth brigade and the theater company, it's in the tradition of the youth pioneer Institute that the Osajevo had in Ghana, the youth that Sekuture had in Guinea, the pioneers of the revolution that Sankara had in Burkina Faso. We must use the children, because when we looked at the African Liberation Day programs all over the diaspora, there's hardly nothing for children these days. Yes. You know, that has to change. Mm. So what we're saying to people who are listening, if you don't have an activity for children in your countries that have this type of narrative, we want to talk to you. Mm. We want to talk to you. We mm. want to work with you. If you have activities like this, but they're not getting the visibility, they're not getting the publicity, they're not getting the support, we mm -hmm. need to see you. Because mm -hmm. having a partnership, having this type of partnership, we can definitely bring attention to those efforts to mm -hmm. show people that this work is going on. Because you will have people thinking, and this is part of, they have to continue to promote the narrative of victimization. So if they mm -hmm. talk about the corruption, if mm. they talk about um, all the problems, people will say, oh man, he really broke the problem down. She really broke the problem down, but they mm. didn't offer a solution. Nor did they talk about their track record of work to, to overcome the um, problem. Mm. They just brilliantly and eloquently articulated the problem. Mm. And this is, this is what we've been going through and we have to stop it. It is making a mockery of our struggle, a mm. mockery of our movement, a mockery of the tradition of resistance. And when a people are oppressed fighting for their liberation, their resistance is all they have. It's their lifeline. And we can't um, continue to let people make a mockery of it. 
we must get back to movement building, not brand building. Mm. When I think when I hear the word brand, I think of animals being branded by their owners. I think of our ancestors being branded on plantations. Mm. I think of our ancestors being branded to reinforce the fact that they would or the only thing they would ever be in this life was colonial subjects. Mm. So I don't even like hearing the word based on what it traditionally means. But I understand that we have a tendency sometimes to try to put a positive spin or negative verbiage. But with that being said, no, 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 we have to get back to movement building and mm -hmm. self-determining movement building. Don't come to me or don't come to us rather spewing all this rhetoric and George Soros finances you or these Western-based NGOs finance you. Mm -hmm. That's not self-determining. And we have too many people running around right now who are financed by our enemies. And, and we don't and we don't know who they are, but we end up we end up learning about this and we end up realizing this. So this is the thing. So we can't continue. And so when people talk about economics, you notice they never talk about us financing our own organizations. Mm. Why would we not finance our own organizations? We don't finance our own elections, but finance our own organizations. Why not? The regional bodies we have in Africa, SADC should finance SADC. ECOWAS should finance ECOWAS. NAPAD should finance NAPAD. That can't happen if neo-colonialist governments are there. And then they're telling you now, uh, take care of everything through elections. What if I don't want to wait till an election? Yes. What if I don't want to wait through an election? And I know the climate of Africa, you know, people want peaceful resolve, right? Mm -hmm. But we can have, like, for example, uh, and I'm throwing this out there on purpose. Um, she's a friend of mine and I admire her very much. Um, there's a deliberate attempt. There's a fear that Samia Nkrumah, the daughter of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, could come to power in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Her election was sabotaged running for parliament mm. because she automatically would have became the face. Of course. And, she would have, and she has a totally different spin on the year of return than Akufa Ado does. She, she has to strongly consider a positive action campaign to take power in Ghana the way her old man did. The All only right. difference would be we haven't had a positive action campaign against neocolonialism. Mm. the same way we had against settler colonialism but we might have but we're going to have to seriously consider that everywhere we have these neo-colonialist governments that doesn't mean we won't take up arms if they if they want to do it that way we will we, we've proven that but if we want to use strikes demonstrations and boycotts that are uncompromising that are militant that are anti-imperialist to unseat some of them then we shouldn't wait till elections why should we become civilized all of a sudden? To prove something to who? Um, you want the approval of the National Endowment for Democracy and the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute? Let them read about it like everyone else. So in, in countries where we're having problems with these governments because their obedience and capitulation to our former colonizers has become unbearable, why wait till elections? Why waste money on posters? Why waste money on a uh, campaign where you can just go ahead and organize properly from the bottom up and unseat these puppet governments before elections take place? Mm -hmm. We're coming to that point too. We're not gonna keep waiting. Some, and we, especially in the places where we know they rig the elections, because, and they target certain countries to divert attention away from the elections that they're able to control. You can look in Zimbabwe. They cried like babies that President Mugabe wouldn't let them come and monitor elections. He didn't feel they need to, that was his right. But then President Monongagwa completely flipped the script on him. He said, come. And the International Republican Institute brought Catherine Samba Panza, Johnny Carson, 
um, from the United States, Obama's former spokesperson in Africa, former ambassador to Zimbabwe under Clinton, a reactionary, a fool, but they brought him. They brought um, um, Constant Barry Newman, who was Bush's spokesperson in Africa, and um, they brought Ellen Johnson Salif. Okay? And the election didn't turn out in their favor, and they didn't speak favorably about the results. But President Monongago wanted to prove this is why we don't let you come. Because when you come, you lie. Or when the outcome doesn't come and turn into your favor, you diminish the value of our process. So, so this is what I'm saying. So, so we continue to, so why do we have to wait for elections? We're scared of them saying that we're not democratic. We're not patient. We're not sophisticated. We have more women presidents than we have women. We've had women presidents. So they can't say we're not sophisticated. So the things that we have been hesitant to try become more appealing in this particular situation. They just do. And we're going to try. We're going to start trying these things. It's just natural. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be able to deal with it. There are two. They're too preoccupied. Comandante Fidel Castro used to call the imperialist octopus, the octopus, they're everywhere. <laughs> so in the United States, we are obligated by history to keep them occupied so that they can stop spreading mischief in other places. We need to keep them occupied. The Vietnamese give the rebellions of the 1960s credit for helping them defeat the United States. When 289 cities went up in smoke, Planes that were headed to Vietnam had to land in Watts, land in Newark, land in Detroit, land in Chicago. So if we're disruptive like we're supposed to be inside United States borders, they will be it will contain them. And the most intelligent minds of our struggle in the United States have always said contain, have always talked about containment of that sort. And as our activity is becoming more militant, they think that by having a democratic um, administration, since our people have voted Democrats since 1912, they think that that's gonna appease us. But Biden is the right type of Democrat because he's a Democrat that's just as racist as any of the Republicans, just as white supremacist in his thinking. So he's the type of Democrat to prove to our people that what brother Malcolm told us, what Du Bois told us, what Kwame Ture told us, that there's no difference between Democrats and Republicans. He's the type of Democrat that will validate their assertion. So we're happy to see that there is that type of Democrat that can be as Republican as the most Republican, a true white supremacist, a proud white supremacist, Joe Biden. So, to, so this help, it actually is very helpful. We're, we're jubilant. Now, we don't care who won the election, but you still strategically have to pay attention to how it impacts the climate and atmosphere, scientifically speaking. So we know that him being in this position, knowing how Zimbabwe makes him vomit, how Eritrea makes him vomit, how Venezuela makes him vomit, that will let our people know that's the writing on the wall that our people inside the United States borders who have accepted the amputated narrative of the African experience, that's exactly what they needed to see. That's exactly what they needed to see. And especially and the last 20, the last um 10, 15 years have been a blast. Uh, 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 some of our younger people are using this term woke. That's what they say. Mm. It makes sense because we were in hibernation during the Obama administration for eight years or under hypnosis. Mm. And then the Trump demonstration and then the Trump administration um Remind was a reminder that things haven't changed at all because we were saying that we were living in post-racism USA, if you remember. Mm. And then Trump reminded you that nothing has changed, just the calendar and the time on your watch. And now you have a Democrat who is going to be just as committed to Trump's agenda, more committed to Trump's agenda than he was. He just happens to be a Democrat. So that is going to make, create a, um, a need for, for more militant fervor all across the board, every area. You'll see, a, you'll see militant expression in the pulpit, in the church, in the classroom, in the hospital, wherever we are. And what that will do is it will force us to recognize how what we do is connected to changing the world, mm. benefiting Africa, benefiting the rest of the diaspora. 
there's a growing appetite and a growing interest to gain more insight and understanding, not of the developments per se, but what we can do to remedy these situations, which is the best thing of all. So, and because the more we talk, when we talk about Zimbabwe, when we talk about Eritrea, remember you have this great rapper, hip hop artist, brilliant brother, the, whose life was snatched from him. And Myas Eshidorm is his Eritrean name, but his, uh, his hip hop name was Nipsey Hussle. Mm. And he told people in Los Angeles, my trip to Eritrea stopped me from being a gangbanger in the streets of Los Angeles. So that's made people in LA curious about Eritrea because mm. of him. They saw what a beautiful person he became. Tiffany Haddish, the comedian is Eritrean, in case you didn't know. Mm. She went home for the first time a few years ago and she was floored. You know how it is when we come home for the first time. <laughs> so, she, so, so she has to know she can do more than she's doing. So the interest in um, our people do not want this narrative that says not only are you saying starting our history in chains in Virginia, but we don't want this history of Africa four million years ago where you can use that to pr propagate the notion Africa is part of our past, but not our present and not our future. So there's a great historian, you've probably interviewed him or you're trying to, um, named Dr. Tony Browder. Mm. And he's doing a lot of work in Kemet, dealing with archeology span and anthropology. Mm. He's a good friend of mine. And I've been talking to him for the last 11 years of us going all over the United States, which is very easy now because we can do it virtually where we begin to do a program called Africa Yesterday, Africa Today, Africa Tomorrow. Oh, yes. yes. So we can talk about Mansa Musa's time in Mali and Modibo mm. Keita's time in Mali together. Mm. We can talk about Ya Santwa's time in Ghana and Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's time together. Mm. We can talk about Shaka Zulu's time in what's called South Africa and who Mangalizo Sabukwe was together. And that's needed because what that will show our people is Africa's part of our present and our future. And Africa's redemption will dictate the type of future we have. So we thank you so much for the time we've had with you today. And we just hope that um, what we shared today uh, met your standards. And um, we hope that your people watching all over the world are pleased with us. Um. Brother Obina, it's it's not about I'm pleased. We we on the Pan African Daily TV know that every voice that is coming to lecture to us is sent. It's a, it's a it's a purposeful uh, mm. conversation. I had a conversation yesterday with a sister who asked me on her show, "Who is the best guest on Pan African Daily TV?" Accordingly, and I said, "Everybody." Because yeah. the African Daily TV is not about assessment of which guest is bringing what kind of theology or whatever, but it is the uh, it's it's purposefully from our ancestors sent to educate yeah. us, and we see that often, it, it, even just the viewers, and so that's why we talk. But, but the no, but the only reason I said that, sister, is because I know how hard you work. I yes. know the labor that goes into maintaining this. And right. I know that, and I know that people, um, everyone that may come before you, for them, it's just another appearance, and yes. they're not concerned with maintaining a relationship. Mm -hmm. They're not concerned with um, transmitting and conveying what really needs to be um, transmitted and conveyed at this historical moment. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they don't value the platform and value the labor and value the organization. So our makeup is different. So mm -hmm. when we say that, it, it's just that we hope that we accomplish the objective, meaning what you were looking for. So it, it, it was nothing more than that. Yes. And you know, we're not, we're not lecturers. We're, yes. um, we're, tra we're, le we're, sir we're a lecturer's worst nightmare, if I can say that. Um, <laughs> we're, 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 transmitter, we're, we're transmitters of knowledge mm. because this history belongs to everyone, even, oh, yes. those who will, even those who won't make a contribution to the history once they get it but it still belongs to them because they're daughters and sons of the African soil. So we just have to give it to them and keep optimistic and hope that once they get it, they're ready to contribute because one's interpretation of our history will determine the quality of contribution they make to our history. Mm. I share. So we thank you, African.
Thank you, Africa. Exactly. That's the point. We thank Africa. It's, 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 I don't know, it's an honor and we're thanking you also. Um, you can see it from the viewers only on this source. We're streaming for multiple sources, but yeah. if you look at just, it's your first time here, it's your first appearance here. And yeah. I, I cannot <laughs> imagine how, because like you said one thing, the truth is the truth. And people are not that dumb to understand the truth. I mean, when you right. start a show for the first time, when people don't even know the guests, and the more as you were explaining and you were coming through, you see how the public grows because people, yeah. most of our audience, like we say, they connected worldwide. And the yeah. more they hear a statement and then they come back and they're curious and they're anxious to learn. And that's how we understand that. We are on the right track from our ancestors. This is a voice calling back the African to order, to consciousness. Yeah, this is the voice that is actually activating those codes. And um, I couldn't even say anything. I was just, you know, from everything that you said, everything that you put together. I mean, the knowledge was just too much, like we combining all this. I can't wait to have you on a special with a Rutendo from, uh, uh, from uh, Zimbabwe. I mean, I will, it's an obligate, I would have to have you and Rutendo on yeah. a summer special if you can already look at your calendar he was when? also watching and he was like who is this and <laughs> Rutendo has been fighting on the u.s sanctions and we've always had him here on the on the yeah. on the, the pan-african daily and he's the actually the voice of every if, if he if he if he if he reads the herald he should know me yes <laughs> of yeah. course I mean, and, it, you know, and, it, and, it's, and you know what, though? I love that response because um, for a very long time, and like I said, you know, um, when you look at our history, it's always been about the element of surprise. Yes. So um, in the last three years, I've been getting that a lot. Um, who is this? Who is this? Right. Yes. And so when people see us, because we're not, we don't go beyond the call of duty to be visible, but that way, when we're visible, we have a lot to share that people can look at and verify mm. and that that and that's just the best you know that's the best way to approach the struggle of ours and um you know so we're oh and we're based in washington dc but i was born in the uk though because i see somebody just asked that question yeah. and um i'll close on this um we have um my father's book destroyed his temple which was about the black power movement and black panther party in britain is being re-released this year Mm. So when we re-release the book, we're going to come on and um, deal with it. But we'll be willing to come on um, anytime uh, and, and just, you know, serve. You know what I mean? So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And we're, you. And, we're and we're lucky to have you. Oh. I I've heard so many wonderful things about you. And when I heard about the challenges on Facebook, I said, oh, I definitely want to go. That motivated me to want to come on. Thank you so much, brother. Like I'm saying, they didn't see OB coming. Like you said, they didn't see mm -hmm. the Madagafoli coming. They didn't see the Malawians coming. And so today we're saying the same thing. Even Africans, uh, they didn't see OB coming. So yeah. it is, thank you, brother. I don't even have thank anything you. more to say. Thank you. Regards to the family, I would meet you in the in the, uh, after the show and that we can plan the way forward. You know. Thank you. Yes, yes. For our collaboration. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. And um, best, best of luck to you, your family, and um, Thank you know, you. long live Cuba, long live Africa. Yes. And um, long live the African fighting spirit. Ashe. One unified African people, one unified socialist Africa. Africa's Ashe. ours. And Ashe. we're taking it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Wow. Madase, Madase, Madase. Good. Jumbo, jumbo, jumbo family. I want to thank all of you. I mean, this is another breakthrough on the Pan African Daily TV. This has just added our list of scholars and our ancestors' voices coming to us each time. First, I want to thank you for supporting. Now, I see our brother Leo Ryan is always, is always constant in supporting the Pan African Daily TV. I mean, it doesn't matter how much, but he is constant doing that every time 
putting money into the process where we pay the bills, where we support the program, where we uh, 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 support the printings and the communication and everything. We are not, just like our brother said, money is never been our focus. But you supporting us to get these programs through, it is just a uh, uh, one of those actions that I say, all of us are great. All of us are freedom fighters. Even if you're just watching, you are part of our guest. You're part of this journey. All of us are the same. We are on the same level. We even don't have hierarchy in Pan-Africanism. Because if you are a true Pan-African, like our brother just said, we are all called to serve. And so we are not going to be worshiping people when they are not accountable, when we don't see track records of their work. And so the Pan-African Daily TV guests are those that we actually see, it doesn't matter. They must not be really high scholars, even just the young ones that are coming up, you know, that are struggling to get into it. They are pulled to it. They are one of the biggest voices and we're giving the platforms to them. So it has been a wonderful play. I mean, I'm just, I'm just like, I'm exploding. And I want to give a big shout out to our queen, uh, Tine Shireh, because it's Shireh who actually introduced Nasha, our, our, our princess of the Pan-African Daily TV, my daughter, my sweetheart, my everything, my God-given. And you can imagine we have never met Nasha and I. Nasha is a daughter, a princess of Zimbabwe, studying here in Germany. And she just got caught up in this program as young as she is. And she reached out to us and say, Dr. Susan, I want to help. I want to be your PA. I want to serve. And she's doing an incredible job. When we meet this kind of speakers, she, she does a lot of research on them, contact them, connect them. It's the same thing like Patrick Kasserim. Patrick Kasserim is just a humble, noble guy from the Tukana city, one of the most remotest area in the heart, in the, in the, in the villages of Kenya. Yeah, this this ones that you really say they are the sons of the poorest of the poorest, like our brother was saying. And we also got connected with Patrick Kasserim on this journey. We've never met each other. We've never seen each other. But the level of work and engagement, none of us have complained that we are tired. None of us have complained. We every day we are working and doing just our work and we do it passionately. We do it with joy. There's nothing else that we can do again in life but serving on this journey. And we learn every day from you. We learn from you because you join us on this voice and you make us understand it is very relevant that we keep the spirit. I want to thank you so much on behalf of this team. Yes, of course, to me and Ia are my two boys. Um, and they the ones helping the technique, you know, they are technique savvy, but they, they also started this journey as we start all from home and they're picking it step by step and everyone is just up to serve. It is a great opportunity. It is. So we reach out to a lot of people, even on the continent, who were um, asking for possibilities to contribute also. Because we understand the PayPal, the Cash App, the Zelle, and all these uh, uh, functionalities, they actually don't work on the continent like we do. So, but because of that too much demand, we also want to contribute. And this contribution aspect for us, in the beginning, we looked as if, you know, we, look, we, we took it with our own colonial minds as if, or, you know, we don't want to bother people or beg for money. But we actually realized that the more people contribute, the more they are engaged, they are serving in their own way. So we give those opportunities. For that reason, we reach out to MTN, Cameroon, and now we have, for those that are in the Western region of Africa that do money transfer by MTN, we have a number there for you. You can do it in your currency. If you say, I wanna support, like you've been requesting. East Africa, now we are also doing M-Pesa. Why M-Pesa? M-Pesa because that's even our own mobile money system on the continent. And it is growing so fast. And so for us to even promote and rebrand it, you can see people also were complaining, you know, the, the, the rate, the, the high rate of even doing the super chat, you take 30% off. So we also provided the possibility, you know, through Cash App or Zelle, it's the same number rolling on our board. But also there are people who said monthly subscription is better 
for me i mean if i commit with a 10 dollars or a 10 euros or a 50 or a 100 for me it's much easier and so i need to do it my bank to bank so we did the international um bank transfer number where you can do that month monthly subscription from the organization and association it's also ruling there so all this feedback is a thank you message that we are here to do the job you're also there to do the job so it's a whole complete thing it's an inclusive thing none of us is left apart it is not anything that is going like we say it is a track record we have to prove everything that we say that it fits with things that we do and so I just love the last statement that the brother said. It is not about us talking about Nkwame Krumah said this, but now putting all the structures in that programs and the projects that he did, elevating the Ghanaians from poverty to this level, this is more what we should be talking about. And that, for that reason, we're coming up also with a series on the legacy of our freedom fighters, the legacy. It's more than just the speeches or sending quotes. We see Africans today that are all right, getting a war. They post all these quotes and stuff like that. So, but we want to get even more deeper into it and a track record of this is what they did every day. It is, it was more than attending a conference or a meeting and making speeches, right? So, yes, we are digging all into that. We thank you so much, uh, that uh, people. Tomorrow, um, I'm still waiting for a conf uh, co uh, confirmation from our brothers uh, in West Papua New Guinea. Um, uh, Brother Raki, uh, the movement uh, director or activist, reached out to me two days ago, and we was we were setting out a plan to do a Sunday special on West Papua New Guinea because I think they have a lot of things going on and they're also progressing. You can imagine this is a country, like we say, are still living in today's colonization, that kind of colonization that they still, I mean, you all heard about it here. You can also research it. But now they started this movement and they're moving step by step and putting more pressure on the Indonesian government, bringing it out on the international community. But their focus is actually mobilizing Africans on the mainland, in the diaspora, because it's our fight. No one would do it for us but us. So I'm still looking, waiting for that confirmation. Then on Monday, we're going to have our brother, like we said, this week is a non-stop week um, from Ethiopia. And he's going to be educating us on the, the necessity of, uh, not the necessity, the opportunities of the River Nile and the history behind it. I mean, you would be amazed, just like brother over here. This brother coming from Ethiopia is powered. What I listened just for the short time that I, I exchanged with him, it is mind blowing. So we have all our experts out there and all our ambassadors, ambassadors for Pan-Africanism. We have all our brothers and sisters, some big voices that are doing exactly what we're saying, track record. They're not just coming to talk about how we have been brutalized or that, but they show you exactly this is what I've been doing for all this time but nobody has been talking about it. So we are going to see yourself. And on Tuesday, it's gonna be about the Amazonian question with Al Wahab Farouk. Now we're getting to get this kind of spirit of Pan-Africanism in which not only the Southern Cameroonians or Cameroonians will talk about their challenge, but now we are seeing that a Ghanaian is actually interested in talking about it. Same thing, we're gonna get uh, this week a Cameroonian that is talking about the legacy of Lumumba. That is the spirit of a Pan-African. We're not just saying because I come from here, then I have to tell my country stories. No, but how do you go out of that space to, to connect all Africans? That is our purpose. So we see us tomorrow. If we don't get the confirmation from uh, our brother uh, on West Papua, West Guinea, then we are going to um, probably do something and we would keep you informed. Thank you so very much and enjoy your weekend. And we stay in touch. And I say Asante Sana Medase to all of you. Bye bye. You are watching the Pan African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want unity, consciousness, our culture, our spirituality our history one africa for africans worldwide motherlands calling its diaspora home 
Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa.